All right. Welcome back, everybody. Um, it's nice to be back. It's been a while since I was here, and uh, Eugenia did an amazing job. Of course, I had to uh, do a shout out to Eugenia. And um, I am sure you'll be seeing more of her uh, doing teaching. And um, so, yeah, she, she did a really good job. I, I just love the whole, just the hand movement. I mean, I learned more from gestures, like how she explained with her hands than what she said. But, and she was going super fast, which, which I like. It was like on point um, because I take a much, much longer to, to um, explain things. But I'm here. And uh, I'm excited to, and I guess um, we're going to start off with chapter 6. Uh, we're still in the book of the Gospel of John. We're chapter 6. I mean, it, it's been weeks, and we've been you know, going verse by verse uh, as the Holy Spirit leads us and, and teaches us from the words of Jesus and um, from the Gospel of John. And we've been learning from the Holy Spirit. So we want to continue on. We want to see, um, this is of course the story of the multiplication of bread which is um, a very important story, and it's practically in every gospel. Um, it's one of the great signs that Jesus was the greater prophet that Moses prophesied about in Deuteronomy, and we'll see why in just a second. Um, the miracle that he did confirms um, who he is and his mission as a prophet to the, to the children of Israel. So we'll start with, uh, with verse 1, chapter 6. So, uh, he says, After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Now, the Sea of Galilee, um, it's, it's just one of the names. That sea had several names, and Tiberias was one of them, a Galilee. And then sometimes uh, there's another different name. I, I just can't remember what it sounds like in English. Uh, Ginisarietske Ozera. I hope that helps. Uh, so, <laughs> so what, what it means is it's the same location, it's the same lake, but if you read the gospel, sometimes it uses a different name, but it's generally the same, same lake, talking about the same place. Um, so anyway, so, they're, so uh, they went over the Sea of Galilee, and then uh, verse 2, Then a great multitude followed him, because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were deceased. Verse 3, so they, uh, I mean, uh, he did miracles, so understandably there's always a following. You can imagine anywhere he went, there were thrones of people just camping out at his door. And another thing, if you want to you know, note, every time when uh, revival breaks out, you know, or God uses a certain place, certain people, certain church, um, it's the same thing happens. I mean, people camp out, you know, on the street, they camp out by the door, and they they're just they're following where God's presence is, and it's very natural for people because why? Because people get healed, people you know their their needs are being met, and the power of God is is released. So, um, you know, if, I don't know if you guys know Pensacola revival in 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 the early in, I think it was ninety five. A same thing happened, and you know, God just broke out. It's on the church service on Sunday. You know, it was it was just an average service. It was there was a guest speaker, Steve Hill, and and the Holy Spirit just broke in, and the revival started. And I don't know if you guys watched footage of it or whatever, but there was just people camping out. I mean, literally, before the doors opened. I mean, you're going to church, and you have like a tent city around the church. Yeah, and then and you try to you know navigate through through the throngs of people that were waiting for the doors to open. Now we have the different problem, the empty churches, right? For a good reason, because the presence of God is lifted. And, the per and so the, you, you know, churches are pretty empty. There's nothing going on. There's, there's, there's no vibrancy. There's no power being released. So every time Jesus shows up, people, you don't need advertisement. People come. Why? Because the power of God is released and it touches people and it heals people. And it ministers to people. Holy Spirit ministers to people. So anytime Jesus shows up, there's always going to be people to minister to. 100% of the time. So if God's presence increases here, well, guess what? It's not going to get easier. It's going to get more people, more need, more, more, more. Why? Because God is touching people and He's healing and He's doing what He wants to do. So don't be surprised if... If you know the, this ministry of seven bells grows to a point where, where it gets really big, 
Why? Well, because God is touching people. Where Jesus comes, there's people. People, you don't need advertisement. People just show up because they heard that Jesus healed people and people were made well and people were resurrected from the dead. All things were happening. Same, same thing here, Jesus, you know, he's, he's, he's walking around and we have thousands of people following him. So that's kind of how the story is being set up by John with what he's about to do. So people is, um, is walking and he has thousands of people or a camp following, uh, a big one too. So it says, and Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat with his disciples. So Jesus would go up in these mountain places and he would teach his disciples. He would choose, it's interesting that he would choose uh, places of, of like wilderness or, or a mountain or a desert place. Or, you know, one time he taught off the boat. And so he would take him out from the, you know, tumult of the city or the, just the business of life. He would, he would draw them out and he would take him and he would spend time with his disciples. He would teach them, instruct them. In fact, he did, a, he did a lot of his prayer time was on the mountain. He would go up the mountain. He would pray through the whole night to the Father. And then in the morning, he would you know, come down and he would do what, what God wants him to do. And so uh, it's not unusual that Jesus would do that. And from that, we can gleam that, that it's you know, when we have this secret place with God, well, Jesus had a secret place with God. He would go off away kind of from people to connect with the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's, that's something that, I, that I, I, I like to do. But, you know, since we're obviously living in the city, we can't go into the wilderness to Idaho or whatever, or Montana to connect to God. So what you can do, you can go within yourself. You can actually talk to God within yourself. Well, how does it look like? Well, how I do it. You, just, you can just lay down and close your eyes and you talk to God in your, with your mind. Because you can think and you just close your eyes and you just talk to Him. And just open your heart to feel His presence resting on you. And you just talk. It's that secret, but nobody can interrupt that place. I mean, it's, it's pretty secret. I mean, it's just you and God within you. you know? um, that's where you can go and hide and talk to God. It's very convenient, especially if you're busy, if there's a lot going on and you just want to just, I just want to talk to God. Well, how do you do it? Just, just close your eyes and just pray in your thoughts, in your mind. Just pray to God in your mind. Just, just focus on Him and talk to Him with your thoughts. That's an inner prayer. And that's how you can connect to God one-on-one -on -one without people interrupting within yourself, within your spirit, within your soul. So that's one of the places that you can always retreat to and talk to God. If you have any problems, issues, go inside of you and talk to God. You just with your thoughts. Pray. So, well, verse 4. So Jesus, uh, he, he went up the mountains and he was teaching his disciples. Verse 4. Now the Passover of Feast of the Jews was near. Again, every year they would, they would go to Jerusalem for, for that, uh, that, that great Feast of Passover. Verse 5, Then Jesus lifted up, lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming towards him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? So, he's teaching, you know, he's spending time with his disciples in, uh, in, in the wilderness, and he sees thousands of people that probably found out. Jesus is on the mountain. You know, he's trying to kind of you know, spend time with his disciples, but it's, it's, you'll find it hard. If God is using you in, in any capacity or work, people will find you. It's just one of those things that um, Jesus had that, and you will have that. If you walk with God and, and uh, God touches people through your life, anywhere you go, people will find you. They'll know who, like, oh, you got to go talk to that person. They'll, they'll help you. So, so that's the same thing happened to, to Jesus. So like he just he was talking to his disciples. He looks and there's a whole bunch of people coming. And again, it's, a, it's like wilderness. So that means there's you know, nothing really close by where you can obviously get food or eat. But there's a lot of them. So Jesus sees this, see that picture. And he says, well, and he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread 
that they may eat. He's asking, well, how are we going to feed these guys? I mean, there's a lot of people there. Um, you know, it's, it's very, very normal thing to ask. It's like you have people, you have a, a service. Okay, what are we going to eat? Okay, guys, what are we doing? I mean, who's going to order pizza, right? <laughs> we got to do something. They're hungry. Um, you know, we got to minister to them. I mean, same with us, right? We have a bunch of people. Well, we pray, we read the Bible, and then what, what, what we think about is, well, what are you going to feed them, right? Who's going to go get the pizzas or, or Taco Bell, right, Ross? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there you go. Which is a natural thing. I mean, we, we have to eat. And so Jesus, I mean, he recognizes that, that need, you know, that people need to eat. So, but he's asking Philip. Well, verse 6, But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Now, his... his I mean, now Philip saw Jesus do miracles, right? He saw Jesus raise people from the dead. He saw people being healed. I mean, he saw some pretty miraculous stuff. So he's testing Philip, like, okay, Philip, um, where are we going to get all this bread? What do you think, Philip? Well, in our natural mind, of course, we're trying to figure out a way to do it, right? Networking. Uh, maybe we should go to the store, maybe set, send somebody to Costco or whatever, you know, who has a Costco card. Anybody has a Costco card? Anyway, so, so, that's, so, so in, that, in an, our natural mind, which is Philip, I mean, he's like, whoa. I mean, he's trying to figure out how much bread and food we'll need, how, you know, how many hot pockets. I mean, it's, it's thousands of people. Like, how is that possible? Well, Jesus knows that Philip saw all these miracles. But isn't it interesting? Every time, like, we can hear a testimony of something miraculous happened, or we even experience a miracle in our own life that God you know, did something for us. Uh, but when, when, when something comes in, as far as like money or, or financial, because we think healing, like God's power, you know, healing, I get it, you know, God wants to heal us. But, but like provision, we're, we're kind of more like, well, yeah, be nice, if, you know, but we kind of think like, okay, I gotta find you know a job, uh, networking. Maybe I can borrow some money from somebody. So we always tend to go into our natural uh, mind to to figure out how we're gonna you know feed ourselves, pay our bills. But Jesus asked that question to Philip to test him. Like Philip, you saw my miracles, and Jesus did miracles not only to heal our body, you know, touch our uh, our life in, in a way or, or fix our life, but He's really concerned what we're gonna eat. He really cares about our jobs. I mean, what are we going to make? I mean, pay our bills. And so, uh, you know, Philip, he defaulted on his natural mind. We do that all the time. Crisis comes with lack of money, especially lack of money. It's one of those things where faith dies with people is lack of money. They can believe for a miracle, for a healing, for different things, but as soon as they don't have enough money, their faith goes down the toilet, like right away. Oh God, where are you? Oh man, what am I going to do? And the fear comes in and just the worry kicks in. Like, like within minutes when you find out that you're going to be short on some money. It's just the way we, we always bounce to that natural means of supply. Now Jesus, he's supernatural. So he's thinking, I will supply. He's the one that supplies everything. If you think about it, um, he's the one that, that give us, gives us our daily bread. And he says, don't be anxious for anything. I mean, don't be, don't, that's not your focus. You all, don't bounce back to your carnal, or just a natural, not even carnal, just a natural mind of where am I going to find, you know, 50 bucks or 100 bucks. Jesus, just come to me. That anybody, when you're tight with money, ask, money, uh, ask, ask Jesus for money or the Lord. We don't naturally do that, right? It's just kind of, it's weird. Like, God, I, I need 50 bucks, you know? <laughs> It's weird, but that would really help me today. But I, I tell you, why not? Why not? We don't have to be like Philip that, you know, like he like defaulted on a natural way. Okay, how are we going to figure out the whole bread situation here? You know, he's trying to figure out who's going to go to the store and, 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 or whatever, a city, or try to get things. We serve a supernatural God. He is provider of everything, not just our emotional healing, our, our physical healing, which is great. We love that. But he actually wants to take care of your financial needs, your daily bread, paying your bills, all those things. The only problem is with us because we don't ask. Because yeah. we try to, you know, 
borrow 50 bucks from a friend or maybe get a second job, which is good. I mean, that's, we do have to do something. But I, I would contend, why not ask the Lord if you have a relationship with Him for whatever you need? Like if you like 200 bucks, why not ask the Lord? He's, he said He will supply all of our needs. Why not ask Him? He's a supernatural God. Again, we're, we're going back to that relationship dynamic with God, right? Where you have a relationship with Him, then you can ask. Now, if you don't have a relationship with Him, yeah, it's, 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 you have to like, hey, can you pray for me? You know, ask the Lord for, on my behalf. But why? Because we don't have that relationship and we lack not only faith, but we, we just don't feel confident enough to ask. So we ask like, okay, Wendy can you, or Eugenia, can you pray for my need? But, but I believe the Lord wants us to have a relationship with Him in a way where we can ask Him directly. Like, Jesus, I need, you know, like, whatever I need. I need, I need a new car, a new tire, whatever that may be. Because He's a supernatural God. And He wants us to, to go to Him for even those little things. Why? Because He is involved in every little thing of our lives. He's that interested in us. And so, so Philip is being tested and he doesn't even know it yet. Well, verse 6, oh, verse 7, Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. I mean, 200 denarii. So think about it. One denarii is a day's wages. I mean, if you want to calculate it in our, in our money, let's say, what's the average? What? 200 bucks a day. Let's just take 200 bucks a day. It's average amount people make, right? So that's 200 denarii. So one denarii is equals one day's of wages. In our money, it's 200 bucks. So 200 times 200. That's a lot of money. And he said, not only that, they'll get just a little bit. I don't know. They'll get one meatball. I don't know. Just something. I mean, we can buy a lot, but it, even that much money will not feed that many people it's like his natural mind is running again it's just like us you know like oh uh, maybe trying to plug holes you know maybe i can ask that friend or maybe you know i can go here maybe somebody will will, will do this for me and we're trying to with a natural mind figure out ways to fulfill our need i believe we had just asked the lord ask the lord for what we need and he will give it to us i really believe that if we have a relationship with him so he's, he's trying to rationalize, say, Lord, I mean, how is that possible? And even 200 denarii, which they might not even had, would not be enough to even buy a little bit of food. Verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, verse 9, There's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? So like, he's like, Jesus, okay, not only we don't have enough money to buy food to feed even to give even a little bit of bread to them but all we have is this 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 you know a lunch of this young boy he, he has five you know loaves uh, of, of the barley bread and and a couple of fish i mean but jesus i mean we kind of know your god but this is a little bit uh, a lot even for you right <laughs> isn't it interesting how we think some things are hard for god why? Because we think, well, you know, maybe he'll help somebody else, but my problem is pretty big. Lord, I mean, I know you're God, but you probably can't help me because it's that big of a problem. Well, that's kind of like the scenario is playing out. It's like, he, I mean, they're talking to Genesis 1 God. You know, it's like, Lord, this is all we have. But even you, I mean, what can you do with this? Well, that's interesting. We'll see what the Lord does with that. One spiritual principle I, I, I see here is for God to multiply something in our lives, we have to bring something. I believe there's, there's, there's something happens when we bring something to God. Now, if you read the Bible, you remember like multiplication of oil. Remember the widow and, and Elisha? Yes. Well, what did he ask? Well, what do you got? You have to have something. So, well, I have a little bit of oil. Perfect. Just get all these cans, bottles, whatever you have from your neighbors, just canister, just get them, lock yourself in the room, you and your son, and start pouring it into the, the oil into those big. Then you go and you sell it and you'll pay off your debts. And the oil didn't cease till they filled up all of their containers. But they had a little bit. I remember Elijah came to the widow and 
he said, you know, feed me first. So like, well, we only have a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil. I mean, I'll, we'll make, you know, a piece, you know, some bread. Me and my son will eat and then we'll die because that's all we have. He said, don't worry, it, it's a little bit. Because the God says he will multiply what you have. A lot of times people, a uh, miracle doesn't happen or the miracle of multiplication doesn't happen is because they don't have any. They eat their seed. Successful people or people that um, actually uh, live in that, in that miracle of multiplication in their life are sowers. Now, if you go in the Bible, and, and I know in Corinthians, Paul kind of expands on that a little bit. He says, if you have seed, and seed is, is it could be time, but let's, if, if you want to generalize it, it's money. Let's say it's like you make $100 a day, right? That's your seed money. Now, you know, what, what do we do with it? And he says, like the farmer, you know, he sows. So like, what do we do with the seed? Let's say I make $100. I have 100 seeds. Well, okay, I can have 20. I could eat, because you know, food, necessities, whatever. You know, then 10, I could, I don't know, save, right? But the rest just plant. You plant it. You give it, in, you sow it into somebody's life into somebody's ministry, into somebody's need. What happens? So you eat a little bit, you save a little bit, and then you sow. So whatever you sow is what gets multiplied. Not what you eat, not what you save. It's what you sow gets multiplied supernaturally. There's nothing supernatural about making money at work. Nothing. You just get compensation for your time. Wages. I mean, there's nothing supernatural about that. You know exactly what you're getting, and you have to do a certain amount of tasks to get a certain amount of money. I mean, it's pretty, I mean, there's nothing supernatural about that. But what's supernatural is you take that seed and you plant it into people's lives. That will get multiplied in your life. It's like sending bread down the stream. It will always come back to you multiplied all the time, every time. So people that are wealthy, they're givers, they're sowers. If you, I mean, even take any corporation. See how much they give to charity. Why? Well, because they figure out the spiritual principle. That's it. That's why they're so wealthy. They sow a lot. Charities, poor people, all of these things. They do it and it multiplies and their businesses grow. Same thing in our lives. It's, a, it's that principle. You have to bring something and then the Lord will multiply it. So in this case, they had you know, six, six loaves of bread and, and then two fishes. All right, so and they're saying, well, Jesus, I mean, we know you're God, but we don't really believe that because uh, I don't think we can, you can multiply bread for that many people. That's a lot of work for you, Lord. I'm assuming they would say something like that or think. Well, Jesus takes the loaves, verse 11, and Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down. And likewise, of the fish as much as they wanted. Couple couple things here happening. So Jesus, he blesses what the little boy brought. So you know the bread, the, you know the bread, the fish. Jesus blessed what was brought to him, and he says, "Now, give it away." Just like remember, um, children of Israel when they were coming out of Egypt, manna would fall every morning, right? God would feed them from heaven. But guess what? People that went and gathered a lot didn't have too much, the Bible says. Who, who gathered little, it was just enough. So when God gives you something, it's going to fulfill all of your needs. It's going to be just enough. What you need, He will completely take care. So people not just got a little piece of bread from the Lord and were so thankful. No. He wants to make sure you're full. And there's going to be some leftovers. As we, as we, well, so when they were filled, or when they ate, filled means ate. Like you go to Golden Corral, you get filled, right? If you go to the Chinese buffet, you get overfilled sometimes, but, but filled. For five minutes. It's not a little bit. With God, there's, there's, there's no scarcity with God. I just want to make this point. There is no scarcity with God. He's so rich and he's very powerful. He, he can make things and he wants to make sure you are fed well, that you are not hungry, that you 
had more than just a little bit like, oh, you know, get the wolf off the door, of, you know, just kind of avoid hunger. He wants to make sure that you eat plenty. He wants to make sure that you have not just enough, but more than enough Amen. that you can give it to somebody else. All right, so he said, gather up the fragments that remain so that, so that nothing is lost. Verse 13, therefore they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five bar uh, barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. So 12 baskets, I mean, not only, you know, a whole bunch of people ate, and they ate well. They were fed. And then they said, okay, let's get all, so there's no waste. There's no waste with God. There's, it's, we waste. He doesn't waste. He, there's no waste with Him. So He says, okay, gather it up. Well, verse 14, Then those men, when they had seen the sign, okay, keep, keep the, that word in mind, that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Now, this is where it is important. I want to stop here. What is the sign? And they said the sign and the prophet. Well, remember that Moses prophesied that God is going to raise up a prophet among the brethren, just like Moses, and that everybody should listen to him. Well, what is the sign? What is the sign where they connected Jesus to that prophet that would come from God. Well, you have to go back all the way to Kings, where Elisha, the prophet Elisha, he came and he met with, with, some, uh, with some people that were, that were destitute and hungry and said, well, what do you guys have? And they said, well, we have, you know, seven, I think it was seven barley loaves. So Elisha was the first one to multiply the bread by the power of God. So as soon as they saw Jesus multiply barley loaves, they completely said, okay, this is what Elisha did. This is a miracle. This is right out of the Bible. And they remember what Moses said, that the prophet will arise. Now, Elisha, I mean, Elisha was a long time ago, but they knew the stories. But as soon as they saw that miracle, it was a sign that Jesus was the greater prophet that had come to the, you know, to, to the Jewish people, to the earth. And so it was a sign and it, it was the confirma confirmation that Jesus is the greater Moses, that He is the Savior of the world. So a couple of things here we can, we can kind of summarize. So Jesus, He is supernatural God. He wants to fulfill all our needs. A lot of times why we, 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 we lack is, is, is because of how or what we do with the seed. I mean, we reap what we sow. It's just this law that, that it's in the natural world and in the spiritual world works the same way. Anyone who sows in darkness, guess what they're going to reap? More darkness. Not just more. 30, 60 to 100 fold. That's how it's multiplied. You know, and if you sow in righteousness, the Bible says, you will reap mercy. 30, 60 to 100 fold. Righteousness means right living. If you sow your time in right living, if you live right, if you, you know, take time, if you take effort to live right, you will, it will multiply and you will reap mercy. You will reap mercy from God in 30, 60, 100 fold. So we are the beneficiary. We're the farmers. So every morning we come out and we start sowing. So the question is, where do we sow? What soil? Exactly what we sow, we're going to eat that fruit. Exactly that kind, except multiplied. You know, some people go and they sow somewhere else, and then they're, they wonder why they're having issues with different things. Well, you just sow the seed, you're just eating the fruit. You are the farmer. And if we sow in, in good ground, if we sow into the Lord, into our relationship with God, we're going to bear good fruit. It's just the way it is. Same with money. Provision. I mean, what do we do with our seed? You know, do we go to Amazon and we just you kind of blow it all and, and then we realize we just ate our seed. Oh my goodness, how am I going to pay my bills? Well, I don't know. You just ate the seed. I mean, it's it's common thing. I mean, if farmer doesn't plant, nothing will grow. You have to go get more seeds. Well, you've got to get a job. Make more seeds. 
But if you're diligent in sowing into ministries, other people's lives, the, the, if you give it to the Lord, let's put it that way, give it to the Lord, you will reap it multiplied in your life. You will not lack. Why? Because you're sowing and then you're having more seeds to work with now. Instead of $100 you sowed, let's say, if you want to take that amount, now God gives you a little bit more. Why? Because the seed multiplies. So you can eat a little bit more, save a little bit more, and give and sow again a little bit more. And it snowballs if you're diligent and if you sow into other people. Um, I, I believe, I mean, I mean, I can say for our life, that's the principle. Some people think that to be like wealthy, that you need, man, if I get this great job, and some people have big incomes and they don't have any money. Did you notice that? Like, how could that be? Such a big income and it's check to check. I mean, they have a lot of stuff, but it seems like they just never enough. It's just like they spend it all. And how does that happen? So the income is not what makes you wealthy. It's the sowing that makes you wealthy. When you sow, it supernaturally, you know, it, it supernaturally grows and it, br it brings fruit. And that wealth that God gives that you receive from the Lord, it actually brings happiness. It actually stays in your pockets. The dollar goes way farther if it's something you receive from God. So I would tell you guys, if you guys want to prosper financially, if you want to prosper in God, sow into good soil. Sow into good soil. Don't sow into bad soil because you're going to eat from that for sure, 100% of the time. And a lot of you know that. You know, even a little bit. You sow a couple of bad seeds. They're going to multiply. They're going to grow. You're going to eat that. And it's not good. So the Bible says, sow into through, through a prophet, it says, sow into righteousness and you shall reap mercy. Well, you want mercy in your life? Sow into God. That's it. Well, how do we sow into God? Easy. Have a fellowship with Him. Start having a vibrant relationship with the Lord. That's how you sow into your time. Put your time in it. I mean, I hear people pray, you know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, one hour a day. That's sowing. They're laboring. They're going to receive a lot of mercy from God. Their lives will change. They will grow faster in God. Things will work out for them. Why? Well, because they're sowing. While some people are Netflixing, they're sowing, you know. That's sowing too. I mean, you, you can sow into watching TV. I mean, that's, that's another ground that's, that's not going to give you good fruit. It's your time. You sow. I mean, how many hours do you sow there? So when you kind of think of that like, I'm a farmer, I'm going out and I'm going to start sowing. Like, what am I going to do with my time? Because your time is your seeds. You go to work, you give your time, you just get compensated in, in paper money, which is equivalent of your, whatever you agreed for your time, whatever the price is for your time. But your seeds are your time, if you want to break it down to the very basic. Your time. Where do you spend your time, spare time? Or you have, you know, you get up, what, 7, 8, 9 o'clock, and you start sowing. Like, where do you sow? Where you sow determines where you're going to be, what you're going to eat, what you're going to reap. A lot of your life um, uh, depends on where you sow. So I really want to encourage you. Jesus is a supernatural God. He will fulfill all of your needs, not just only healing in a body, which, which we love, and, and emotional healing, you know, restoration of families, relational healing. We contend for that. That's the first thing we, got. we, we want God to heal us so we can actually function, so we can actually live. Now, that's the first thing we go. We pray for deliverance. We pray for, you know, healing in the body, in the soul, in the mind. All those things we do first. Why? Because we, that's, I mean, if, if that doesn't happen, you're not even capable of sowing into anything good. We have to deal with the spiritual first. The spirit man has to, has to, be, has to be dealt with first. That, you know, being born again, being saved. And then the soul gets second is, is all those addictions, all of those uh, roots and fruits have to be pulled out one by one. It's, it's labor. Just like in a garden, there's weeds. You've got to pull them out. And that's the problem is the weeds that will ch always choke out the good seed. Some people think, well, I'll, I'll sow some weeds and then I'll sow some good seed. I'll tell you, it will choke out the good seed. The tares will choke out, the, the, the weeds will cho choke out good seeds. Even if you read the Bible for 20, 30 minutes, but if you, you know, sow six, seven hours into something that's not good, bad ground, that will choke out 
the good seed you, you sowed earlier, even if you, you know if you spent consistently in prayer. So be aware of where you're sowing. It's very important because God wants you to prosper. He wants you to have not just enough, but He wants to bless other people through you. That's where it's going. It's not like I just want to have enough and, and, and that's it. No. Not only you, want, you will have enough, but there's going to be left over to minister to other people. There's always left over. There's, with God, it's not only just enough for you, but there's always something for somebody else. Yeah. And I'm telling you, when you eat from the Lord's table, there's always something to give to somebody. You, you think you don't have it, but when the time comes, you talk to that person, you're just amazed, where is the stuff coming from? Like the encouragement, the words of knowledge, like what is this coming from? Well, because you're eating from the Lord's table, there's always something you bring. You, you don't even realize it. You're feeding somebody else that is, you know, maybe new in the faith or maybe not even in the faith. They're like, look at you like, man, you're different. What's wrong with you? You, you you're not the same person I used to know. Well, because you eat at the Lord's table. Because in your spirit, man, is fed. And you're just sharing your testimony. You don't think you're doing anything special. But that grace, it overflows into other people. Same thing with bad diet. You eat garbage. Well, that overflows too. You start, you know, uh, going around bad company. It corrupts. Bad company corrupts, you guys. It's easy. Spend a few days in, in bad company and all of the good seeds will get choked out before you know it. And you'll... Start thinking, scratching your head, what just happened? I was just, you know, walking with the Lord, and in two days, I, I feel like, you know, famine is, is hitting. Famine. <laughs> but that's it. that's the reality. But if we're consistent, and we said, you know what? I'm not gonna keep. I'm not gonna be part of bad company. I'm not gonna sow there. I'm not gonna watch this. I'm not gonna sow there. I'm not gonna put seeds there. I'm not. I'm gonna read my word. I'm gonna get a couple, two, three people that 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 are hungry after God. And I'm gonna, we're going to meet up. We're going to read the Bible together. We're going to pray together. That's good ground. I am telling you, you're going to reap mercy. You're going to reap so much from God in spiritual growth, in financial growth. I mean, all the areas God will touch. Why? Because it's good ground you're sowing. You're going to reap mercy in every area of your life. So I want to encourage everybody, ladies. I want to encourage you to have a strong fellowship with the Lord. He is more than enough. Everything you need is in Christ. Everything. Absolutely everything. He is a Genesis 1 God. He created everything. He wants to make sure you have not only enough for yourself, but something to help and, and sow into somebody else's life. So I think we're going to stop here at that, um, you know, at the feeding of the 5,000. And um, I want to pray. Just bless you guys and uh, encourage you to walk with the Lord, to seek the Lord in the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, I... I just want to bless the ladies, Lord. I, I want to bless them, God, that they would sow in good ground, God. That they would have bread, God. That they would have food, God. That they would have the seeds, God. That, that they could sow them into, into you, Lord, into, into good ground, into people's lives. That they would see the need of others, God. That they would put others above themselves and sow into other lives, God. Lord, how... How amazing you are, Lord, multiplying. That's, it's, a, it's the miracle of multiplication when we have something and we give it to somebody else that needs it, God. And you just multiply it in our lives. And we have just more to give and more to give. And we grow, Lord. And we, and we get to use that too, Lord. And, you, and, you grow, and we grow rich in God, in His blessings, in His mercies. And, and the blessings of, of Deuteronomy 28, it just overtakes our life. Everything we do in the city, in the house, we're blessed. And the hand of God is on us because we sow in good ground, because we sow in you, God. And I pray that you would strengthen their inner man, that they would seek you, Lord, that they would find that secret place where they would always run to you and just fellowship with you, Jesus, and grow in that relationship, Lord, and that they would have boldness to ask you for things, Lord. So there will be more miracles and testimonies as how you supernaturally provided for some of these ladies, God. And, and I want them not to worry, God, and be anxious about anything, Lord, but always run to you and ask you for things. That because you are seeking relationship, God, and you, just, you always want to help. You just, you're just waiting for us to ask, for us to ask, what do you want from me? That's what you said, Lord. And I pray that you would bless them in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen.